giving you a voice, making it loud our own way. Welcome, Welcome to the fun. First Updates Now FTC is produced in partnership with the Orange Alliance. Make TOA your place to go for FTC team stats and event results at theorangealliance.org. And also, viewers like you. We need your help to keep fun loud, live, and independent. Help us by visiting our Patreon to pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now. You can also support fun live on Twitch for a few bucks a month or by linking your Prime account for free and clicking subscribe. Hey guys, and welcome to FTC Live. I'm Ethan from Fun FTC and GoBuilda, and we're going to have a little bit more of a casual stream tonight. I'm going to be showing you guys how to convert a standard 27.4 um, to 1 strafer into a 19.2 to 1 5 feet per second strafer chassis. Um, I'll be taking questions about just about anything GoBuilda throughout the whole show, so feel free to tag first updates now in the chat. Um, at the end, you guys will have a chance to play me in trivia for a chance to win 60 bucks. So, yeah, we can pretty much just jump right in. Um, this is a, a Strafer chassis. We re-released it at the start of last season, and it's done really well. Um, a big advantage of something like a Strafer chassis is it is a motor in tube design. So you can see the drive motors um, use a 90-degree bevel gear to drive the, your mechanic wheels in this case. Um, and something that we got a lot of feedback about last year was just the overall tangent speed. It was about three, uh, it was about four feet per second, if I remember right. Um, and a lot of teams really liked it, but a lot of teams just felt like they wanted more speed out of it. Um, so sometime, just a few months back, we released our miter gears. So a miter gear is a specific kind of bevel gear. Uh, it's a small subset where, um, it is a bevel gear, um, so those things aren't necessarily mutually exclusive, but it's always a one-to-one -one ratio, and I believe it is always a 90-degree angle. Um, they're used oftentimes in like a right-angle attachment for a battery drill, um, and we've kind of adapted and made our own for the GoBuilder ecosystem because there are a lot of applications where um, you just can't find the perfect drive, uh, perfect ratio with a two-to-one bevel set and one of our gear ratios. So um, you can flip this chassis over and kind of like a cooking show, I've done um, three of these already. So we kind of can see how it'll end up looking. And we've got one more left to do that is the old style that uses those two to one bevel gears. So to do this, um, as far as tools, I like to have three main ones. Um, over here, I've got a ball end three mil hex driver. These are great for getting inside the pinch bolts in the hyper hubs in those mechanical wheels. I've got a flat head, um, flat and three mil driver. I like these over the standard or the ball ends just because they get a little more bite out of screws um, and can get them out of places easier. And I've got a two and a half mil driver that's also flat end. Um, because we don't need the ball end functionality anywhere in this chassis, I like it a lot better, especially on those small set screws. As far as parts, um, we've just got our our 25 or 2315 um, miter gear. We have one in an eight millimeter Rex bore and one in six millimeter D. We've got a 90 millimeter length 2102 series eight millimeter Rex shaft. Um, so a 1310 series eight millimeter X hyper hub, a 2910 series aluminum clamping collar and an eight Rex bore. We've got a two millimeter thick 32 diameter pattern spacer. This is a 1504. We've got one two pack of eight millimeter ID 14 mil OD bearings. These are a 1611. And then finally, we've got a 1514 series eight millimeter ID spacer. We have one that's four mil long and one that is six millimeters long. Something that we're doing today is actually also converting the drive wheels of this chassis over to six millimeter, or excuse me, over from six millimeter D to eight millimeter Rex. Um, this isn't something you need to do in your chassis. I like it because it gets you a little more beef. And since these wheels are a little exposed, 
means if you hit a wall or if another opponent hits you during a match, you just have a little bit more of a beefy axle to rely on driving those wheels. In addition, we're also switching over to a 312 RPM or 19.2 to 1 motor. This is a little bit slower and a little torquier than the 435s that come in this kit. Um, those are 13.7 to 1. And it's really just a tried and true ratio for FTC. Tons of teams have been crazy successful running about a 5.25 feet per second change in speed on their drivetrains. And I have seen some teams stick with the 435s um, as their final output. So you end up with closer to 7 feet per second as a tangent speed. And that works great in a lot of games, um, especially where your sprint distances are longer or where you're building lighter robots. But as you increase your weight or as your sprint distances decrease, you want a little more torque to just increase that acceleration. Um, so we're going to switch over those motors. You can, but you by no means have to. So to start off, we'll grab our ball end three mil driver and get those pinch bolts out of there. These are the pinch bolts on the hyper hub on this mechanical wheel that hold it in place. Let's see. There we go. Hmm. There we go. I think whoever assembled these chassis um, ended up using the Josh type method, which is the very tight screw method. Um, because we're switching to eight recs, I need to switch out the hyper hub on this mechanical wheel. So I'm going to do that right now. I'm just going to end up pulling out the screws in this wheel holding the hub on. And generally, as I go around screwing in or unscrewing bolts in fashion like this, I'll do the crisscross method um, where you'll start with one screw here and just get it a little snug, definitely not tight and run around the wheel doing every opposite screw. This just gives you a lot of opportunity to get make sure those threads go in the right way. And then once they're all fairly snug, go through and tighten each screw individually. And now our wheel is ready. So set that aside for later. Um, now we've got a couple collars on this shaft still. We need to get one of those off. So we've got our two and a half mil driver to pull that first collar off. Next, we want to, if I can get it turned, get to the pinch bolts in the hyper hub that'll hold on that bevel gear. And loosen those up. Make sure not to lose any of those parts. All right. So, um, Angelica, excuse me, from the chat, um, asked, Angelica, uh, what are the benefits of mitre gears versus belts? Um, and that's always a very good question. To me, it's very application dependent. Um, if you're in a situation where you want to transfer, transfer that torque over a long distance, belts are awesome um, because they're pretty lightweight and they're very efficient. Um, mitre gears are great when you want that 90 degree angle where you want your bevel or your, your gear, gear motor to be 90 degrees from the output shaft. Um, of whatever you're driving. So they're great for that kind of close compact ratios. Um, so in a, in a motor and tube design like this, bevels are great. Um, with a belt system, I've seen a lot of teams just face mount their motors. So they're sticking out kind of like this and we'll run a belt from that motor output shaft to the driven wheel. And that's a great way to do it. Um, and I've seen a lot of teams have a lot of success like that, but you can lose out on some center space everything is a little bit of a, um, a trade-off between certain things. So we've got our, our motor pin and bevel off. Um, all of these parts we're done with today since we're switching over to eight racks. Um, so we'll put those back in the parts bin for now. And now we're taking out the four screws that hold the, the 1201-432, the quad block, um, onto the channel. One thing that I've seen a lot of teams do with these straker chassis, which I really like, is they will actually have a spare 
um, motor assembly. It'll have the motor, it'll have a 1201, a quad block, and it'll have the bevel gear pre-installed. So if you're ever in a tough situation in a competition where you've got to switch out that motor, all you need to do is these four screws, basically pull off your mechanical wheel, undo these four screws, and swap in a new motor. Um, and it just saves a little bit of time if something ends up happening to one of your motors in the middle of a match and you need to have it ready in five minutes. It's a good opportunity to. So now we've got this out. We're going to take these four screws that mount the face of the motor. And since this is the faster ratio that I think I'll end up using on this chassis, I'm going to set this motor aside. Um, if it was me and it was my money, I honestly would probably not buy the 312 RPM motors right off the bat. Um, you can just get by with the miter gears themselves and this pattern spacer and swap in your 435 RPMs and to just give it a try. I know it's very fast and it can end up being too fast for some challenges, but it's a good way to save some money. So now this is all taken apart and um, we are ready to start reassembling. But we can stop and ask, answer a couple more questions. Let me see. All right. Um, try, try Xavier, I think, is asks, do most FTC bots use Swedish wheels or mechanisms? Um, I don't think I've heard them called that before. That's interesting. I, I doubt most teams do. Um, personally, they are kind of an investment for a lot of teams. So they can cost some money. Um, and to me, I think it's very region dependent. I'm hail from Iowa and a lot of teams there are generally kind of long-term and sustaining and do end up buying mechanisms at some point in their lifetime. But I think there are a lot of especially newer regions where um, that is not as common. Let's see, Dan's man 805 has a couple questions. Um, he asks when miter gears are coming out, which is a very new and original question. I've never heard it before. Uh, um, and how many CDC teams do you think put you on their snack list? I know at least one team has. Oh man, I'm not, I really have not kept up with CDC. Um, at least one, it sounds like. <laughs> so now we're going to get back to um, assembling the system. So I've got my new motor and I've got this 1504 pattern spacer. So this will go in between the motor and that quad block. And this time you're flipping that quad block around. So the fingers kind of face the body of the motor. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop those four screws through the through holes on the 16 pattern on this quad block, then take my pattern spacer and line up the through holes on the pattern spacer to the through holes on the quad block and kind of just set that whole assembly over the motor. I'm doing my best to line up those screws and then I can just pretty much run the screws right into the face of the motor. Um, we do lose two millimeters of thread depth here. So in an ideal world, if you've got it laying around, switching these 11 millimeter screws out to 13, 14th mm, would be a really good option. It's by no means necessary, but I might do it. Interesting. All right. So we've got that motor assembly done, and now we've just got to slap that miter gear right onto the output shaft of the motor. Let's see here. Mm -hmm. So um, now we've just got to put it back in the channel. So we're going to put the, our drive wheel on this second hole right here. So we want to look for the next hole back, find that vertical slot and just shift one hole back from that. It's the same hole placement that you're used to on the old strafer chassis. Not the old strafer chassis, um, the, the chassis you just took apart. <laughs> Let's see here. Uh, Batboy 2021 asks, um, what does the manufacturing process of making bevel gears look like? Um, does it just look like a gear cutter that's set at a 45 degree angle? Uh, Man, that is a very good question, 
and I'm really not 100% sure. Um, I know I've watched videos on YouTube, people cutting bevel gears, and they always look really cool, but I've never honestly dug very deep into the the actual manufacturing process. Um, I'm thankful enough to be over in R&D, and I can work pretty much in finished products and CAD. <laughs> so that's always nice. Let's see. I know Ashan has prepared just a couple questions. Um, he asked, um, is anything changing at Gobilda due to COVID? Which is always a good question. Um, and it's really kind of been a crazy time for all of us. <laughs> Thankfully, uh, knock on wood, Central Kansas has been, doesn't have very many people. So we have not been affected um, very much in our local areas. And we've actually even been able to take some interns this year because things are slowly getting back to normal. Um, so we'll see how that ends up. But for now, at least, we're all back to work, trying to practice our social distancing and all that. But it's nice to be back in the office and be able to talk to people. So we've got our motor in place with our, with our miter gear on there, just like that. Now um, I will take my 8 millimeter rex shaft and this 2910 clamping collar. And I just need to put that clamping collar and make it flush with the end, with either end of this Rex shaft. Um, one thing that's cool about these clamping collars is they've got a built-in shim. So um, when you're running bearings, you want to make sure that whatever is flush up against them only contacts the inner race of the bearing, which is the part that actually spins. Um, if you're running a bearing right up against a flat plate like this, the outer race of the bearing, which is generally static, um, will end up rubbing against your motion component and you end up with a lot of undue friction. So these have got um, basically just a quarter mil bump out that's smaller than the outer race, but larger than the inner race to act as kind of an integrated shim. So we will make sure that integrated shim is facing inward and we'll drop one of our eight mil ID bearings on there. Let's see. Uh, Sandra10243 um, asks, weird question, but is there any reason why Gobilda is in Kansas? Um, I totally get it, and I think I asked that same question just about a year ago. Um, and I think a lot of it is down to uh, our founder, Brian, who you've met on a couple of previous shows, um, is from here. I'm pretty sure he's a local to our small town of Winfield, Kansas, and he really just loves it here and, and doesn't want to move which I totally understand. But we're a lot of local people. A lot of people who work here are from here in Winfield or the neighboring cities. Um, and generally, we're very happy here. Um, it's nice to be in kind of a small, quiet town sometimes. All right. So uh, now I've got my 8 millimeter Rex Miter gear in place as well. Um, and that doesn't have to mesh now. We'll look at that later. And I've got that bearing pressed in almost into the channel. There we go. Now I will, I guess I already did that absentmindedly, insert the other bearing with a flange facing out on this side of the channel. Now we've got our two, our six millimeter and our four millimeter spacer. Um, these end up being 10 millimeters, which is just about the perfect distance to space off your mechanum wheel. Um, so, this Allen key, this Allen wrench was ball end, which I needed, um, but that bolt was very tight, and it is not ball end anymore. I think it's, that used to be the ball. So I have this little L Allen key that I'll use to get in, reach into that mechanical wheel and tighten up those pinch bolts in the hyper hub that we pre-installed earlier. Let's see. All right, so now um, this shaft is pull it fully constrained. If you tug on the wheel, it shouldn't move at all. And if you try to tug on this shaft, it shouldn't move at all. But our bevel gears are not meshed right now. So our motor is not driving our wheel. Um, here is kind of the part where you've got some flexibility. I've seen some people use um, bevel gears in a way that prioritizes um, like zero backlash, very minimal backlash behavior or they're very tight and they may have a little more friction, but they're very precise. And some people will run them a little spaced out and um, will get a little more free flowing, a little less friction, but 
a little more backlash. And that's kind of how I have the rest of this chassis set up. There's a few degrees of backlash. Oh, man. Um, but it should be generally pretty okay. Let's see if I can fix this. There we go. Looks like I've got that camera back. Um, let's see. Festive Invader, <laughs> who's I, I believe is an intern here, um, said that this table looks amazing. Um, I think that he's the one who ended up building this table. Um, the frame itself under this piece of wood is all Gobilda. So a lot of our furniture over here is all made of our C-channel um, that you can kind of box and make really big projects out of. We like it. It kind of adds to the aesthetic and all of our desks and stuff like that is out of channel. Let's see. Ethan, how many people uh, work for Gobilda? We have um, somewhere around 20 employees. So we're still a fairly small company. Um, that number does kind of fluctuate because we get some, always get some temporary help around when we need to get ship a lot of orders out really fast. But right now we're sitting at just about 20, I believe. Um, and we're all kind of split up in some different departments of normally five to sometimes 10 people. Let's see. Um, Sundra10243 asks, what should you do if a bearing goes all the way in on most sides, um, but one side there's a clearance between the flange and the chain? Let's see. What should you do if a bearing goes in all the way on most sides? Bit of clearance between the flange and the channel. Hmm. Let's see. I'm not totally sure I understand your question. Um, definitely, if you've got a picture, that would really help. Um, I'm always over. Um, you can always tag me over in the first updates now Discord, and I can definitely help you over there. Or if you shoot us an email to tech at gobilda.com, we can give you a hand there. Um, if the bearing is just a little large or your channel hole is just a tiny bit undersized, um, oftentimes that can end up being um, something that's called a press fit or an interference fit, which even can just be <laughs> Um, say your bearing hole being right on 14 millimeters and your bearing that goes into it also being right on 14 millimeters. Oftentimes to get that kind of nice slip fit that you can get in Gobilda and other building systems, you need to give a little bit of clearance. Um, so a 14 millimeter hole, something that is supposed to accept a 14 millimeter part will oftentimes be something like 14.05 millimeters um, or oversized by one to three thousandths. That um, just gives you a little bit of flexibility and means you don't need something like an arbor press to press that part in. The flip side is that part's never gonna be as perfect as if you use an arbor press and press through an interference fit and get something that's really tight and really in there. So you'll always have a little bit of imperfection um, even if that's just one to three thousandths of an inch it can end up stacking up. Um, something like a bearing and a shaft have to have much tighter tolerances. So model A um, probably will have to be very, very, very similar to model B, where in a situation like channel, your bearing can fit a little bit looser than um, in the channel hole than your shaft can fit in a bearing. So stuff like that um, is always kind of an art, and a lot of machinists are very, very good at figuring out hey, this needs to be undersized by whatever crazy amount. Um, again, I'm lucky enough to really not have to worry about that whole lot. Um, I get to mostly deal with you guys, our customers, um, and design parts occasionally as I figure some out. All right, so we can kind of jump in and start spacing out these miter gears. So our miter gears um, have just a bit of tooth that comes out from the face of the gear. So you have a small ledge around that tooth. Um, to get perfect spacing with these, all you've got to do is line up those ledges so that the shortest part of the face of the gear um, ends up pretty much being in contact with the shortest part of the face of the next gear. Um, this is a long way of saying, you kind of want to snug it up against each other, make sure everything looks pretty good and tighten up those set screws. And this is kind of a, it, it's tough to explain over video, but it's kind of one of those tight but not too tight situations where um, you want to make sure that mesh is tight enough that you don't have very much backlash, but loose enough that you aren't 
creating undue friction and causing those bevel gears to have to wear out of the material of the neighboring bevel's teeth. So here, this sounds fine. Um, I think you can run this on a chassis fine. It's not quite as smooth as I would like. There you go, that's a very smooth one. Um, so I might add a, just a little more spacing in there. Um, so I'm gonna end up backing this bevel that's on the motor off just a tiny bit. Crank down that set screw a little bit more. And I've got a little more backlash as you can see here. Um, so if I'm running off driving coders, I might not do that. But um, this gives me a very, very smooth running system and I think it will last me really well. Let's see, Ashdu11 asks, hey Ethan, I love the bevel gear setup, but it's really hard to mount stuff on the channels if the motors are in. Um, is there a way around that? Um, I totally get that. Uh, I built a robot kind of over some lunch breaks this year and I definitely ran into that. Um, a lot of times when I'm going through and have a big build day, I'll just drop the four screws that hold that motor quad block in place and pull that whole motor assembly out. And that gives you full access to all of the screw holes around that motor in channel. Um, another option is to go with something that isn't bevel gear based um, or that isn't a motor in tube drive setup where you've got something like a belt or a chain running out to the outside wheels. This just gives you a lot more space to play with um, and generally is perfectly reasonable. But unfortunately, it can be kind of the nature of the beast when you're talking about um, something like a motor in tube. Mm -hmm. um, oh man. I did not install this bevel gear like I did the rest of them, which is perfectly fine. It won't affect performance at all, but while we're over here, I think I'm going to fix that real fast. Um, it shouldn't take quite too long. So, I'll end up um, just taking that back apart to really fast. There we go. And as you can see, there really is not a whole lot to a setup like this as far as disassembly for maintenance um, and other things. You can get a wheel off in very quick time um, because of that cantilever drive wheel setup. I know a lot of teams do really love um, a parallel plate system where you've got another plate on the outside of your drive wheels. And that is nice because it can protect those wheels. Um, but personally, when I'm building robots, I like cantilevered wheels. Um, it gives you a very nice frame to build off of at the start of your season. And um, I think it gives you a lot of flexibility, too. You, I have seen a lot of teams add an auxiliary outside plate to a striker chassis or another cantilevered go build a chassis um, to protect something like a dead wheel odometry system or whatever else you'd like to fit in this space here. And that can kind of give you a little more protection from bumps and jostles and makes playing defense a little safer because there's generally fewer places for another robot to get caught in yours, which is always a good idea. I think at least. All right, so I flipped that miter gear back over to the outside, so it's the same as my other four motors. It really doesn't matter. Um, I like the looks of this configuration better, and I like the ability to run screws on the inside of this channel um, versus the outside. Generally, it's a lot less useful to me at least. Um, I want this inside channel space for mounting a lift or another mechanism more than I want the space for screws right by that wheel. All right. So it, I've done this definitely before where I tried to start spacing bevel gears before I tightened down my wheel. Um, so my shaft wasn't fully constrained and then I had to start over on my gear mesh. Let's see. So we got that tightened back up and we'll kind of start over on our gear mesh. Um, we, are, we left that the motor pin and gear in place. So all we really got to do is get that wheels miter gear snugged up against the motors and give it a test spin. It's a little tighter than I would like. So we'll bring it back just to here. 
another thing I've seen, another thing I've seen teams do um, is 3D print spacers to go behind their bevel gears on a strafer chassis after they've got it dialed in and like the way it's at. This um, is nice because it can constrain your bevel gears very well. So if one of these set screws ends up coming loose during the course of a match, um, they are st they really can't slide toward each other. But the spacers behind those wheels um, in between generally the bearing and the miter gear can stop it from going backwards as well. So even though you could take out those set screws if you wanted to, um, you still are fully constrained and will keep driving those wheels even if something bad were to happen. Um, another, th another thing that generally is nice is to add Loctite to a lot of screws that you don't think you're going to uh, have to very commonly take out and put back on. So, or things that are very important. Uh, if it was my robot in my season, I would put Loctite in all of these miter gear screws um, and probably in the screws that mount my motor to this quad block. Just because if any of those screws comes out, your wheel is probably going to be locked up. Um, so make sure, making sure those are tight and making sure you might add some Loctite is always a good idea. Um, something that I've seen a lot of teams do on accident incorrectly is mounting their mechanical wheels upside down. So the proper orientation of mechanical wheel is an X from the top. So this roller should, these two rollers should make a straight line and these two rollers should make a straight line. Um, and that's nice because it means any rotation of the overall chassis means your motors themselves have to turn. So that is a very controlled motion. Um, whereas if those make an O from the top, which I can show you by flipping this whole chassis over, this chassis can now rotate by rotating the rollers themselves. So this chassis can spin around in circles without back driving those motors at all. Um, this means that that motion is not controlled. So somebody can come along and hit you and you'll just spin out. Um, the general symptoms of this is you'll turn when you strafe very, very easily. So when you, as you're translating to the right or left, um, your robot will tend to arc very dramatically. That's always a good thing to check, um, and it's something that I have teams check. The first step in troubleshooting always is, hey, is your orientation the way it should be? Um, other kind of troubleshooting things um, when your chassis isn't working is check all your screws. Um, oftentimes, a screw that can hold your motor on, um, one of your face mounting screws can back out and run into that gear. Um, some teams have the 1201 screws, the quad block screws, um, will sometimes, if they're not tight enough, back out and run into the wheel. Um, and they'll start scraping and generally just produce unpleasant noises. So those are a lot of times the issues that most teams who email in um, have with our straight for chassis is just screws that come undone or upside down mechanics. Um, so, ooh. Mm, Chignib, oh man, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Um, anyway, uh, asks, how would adding higher RPM motors affect the chassis? So that's always a loaded question, and I think you're going to get a different answer from about everyone you ask. I think that it's perfectly reasonable depending on the challenge and the weight of a robot that you've got on it. Um, so you've got the classic motor pro motor um, issue where you've got a limited amount of torque and speed. You can only go so fast and with so much torque. As you increase speed, you decrease your torque. Um, and motors, at least brush DC motors like we use in FTC, will peak in their power output when they're at just about 50% of their stall torque as far as load goes. Um, this is easy to visualize on an arm. If you say you have a one inch arm, and a weight on the end or a load um, that is 50 ounces. So if you got a motor that stalls at 100 ounce inches, that is 50% of your stall load of your motor. Um, and that's generally about where your motor will peak in output power. That's where it's going to put out the most. So that's where you want to try to target your ratios. Um, something like a chassis is tough because there's no really defined amount of load. Um, it'll change as you accelerate, 
as you decelerate and everywhere in between. So it can be a little bit of trial and error. Um, at least within the experiments that I've done, I think that both uh, tangent speed of about five feet per second, anywhere up to um, in the seven to seven and a half are all perfectly reasonable. Um, as you get higher speeds, that chassis is better at doing long sprint dis distances, something like a far box robot in real recovery, um, or most robots this year, especially like a feeder, those have traditionally very long sprint distances. So that higher speed, but slower acceleration treats them very well. Um, something with a slower ratio has more torque and is better suited to a, a um, pretty short sprint distance. Something like a close box on Rover Ruckus um, would be great for something like a 312 RPM motor because you can you get a lot of get up and go, uh, but you're still fairly fast for things like autonomous. That was a very long way of saying both are good. Um, I've seen teams at the very top level of competition do very well with both um, very fast ratios. I think Kraken Pin and ran um, 12.9 to one on a 100 millimeter wheel and were world's division finalists in relic recovery with that ratio. Rover Ruckus with that ratio, excuse me. Um, and I've seen teams like Gluten Free just be absolutely incredible on 100 mil wheels with 19.2 to 1 motors. So it, it's up to you. Um, lots of teams like fast, lots of teams like a little bit slower, but it comes down to your application and the amount of overall um, speed that you need out of that system. Uh, let's see. Batboy 2021 asks, um, I'm still waiting on brushless FTC motors. Um, will those come out? So we really don't have a lot to say on what's FTC legal or not. Um, we have kind of played in that space because we've had a great opportunity to. And because a lot of teams have said, hey, these parts are awesome for FTC. Uh, help us out. And we've started developing more parts for that use case specifically. Um, brushless motors are great because they're very efficient um, and they can generally run very, very fast. A lot of times um, the speed you can run a brushless motor just ends up being how fast can I run the bearings inside of it without blowing them up. So a lot of brushless motors in the hobby space will run at 50,000 RPM, just crazy high numbers. Um, and the, the trade-off to that is that, um, well, not really a trade-off. A lot of the commonly available brushless motors that you can find on Amazon or a lot of hobby websites are designed for RC cars, where you're running a LiPo battery that can sustain a peak current drain of 500 amps if you want to. So they're basically designed to pull 100 amps on acceleration, really get you off the line, and spin out the tires before you can do any damage real load to that motor, um, which is great for that application. You just need to take off the line and go, go, go. But for an application like FTC, where you have a lot of sustained loads on something like a linear slide, that very, very high current draw would end up draining batteries very fast, even if FTC adopted a, a battery chemistry like LiPo. Um, so very high current drain motors oftentimes either mean um, an application where you're not drawing much current for very long or very big batteries like you can see over on FRC. Um, they would be awesome for FTC overall, especially if you have found a, a lower current draw brushless motor because it means you can get more out of your batteries. But at the scale we're playing, I like these motors. Um, they're overall pretty nice. Let's see. Um, hey, Ethan, real quick before uh, we get into the next question, just a heads up. If you are watching live in chat, we are going to be playing mm -hmm. Take From Fun Trivia very soon. Uh, and you're going to have a chance to play against Ethan. So if you're interested, uh, you can join the call-in channel queue right now. That is your opportunity. There are only eight spots available in that. And we will take one of the random people in there to play. Make sure your microphone works in Discord. Uh, we'll put the Discord mm -hmm. link in just a moment. But we'll be playing Take From Fun Trivia uh, with the current mm -hmm. jackpot of $60 uh, to play against Ethan. So go ahead and join the queue for that, and we'll be playing in just a few minutes. Oh, man. Um, so I think we'll have one more question. Um, we have some chassis already for some of our teams. If we wanted to upgrade the miter gears, would we simply have to buy the miter gears and that's it? Or, um, And that's a great question. And a chassis here, I switched over to 8 Rex. 
um, because I love that shaft system for drivetrains. You absolutely don't have to do that. Um, if you want to switch over to a miter gear setup like this, all you need are two six millimeter D miter gears. Those are 2315-1006-0030 and one two millimeter thick pattern spacer. It'd be a 1504-0032-0020. Um, that pattern spacer moves the motor's output shaft back just a little bit so that the end of the output shaft doesn't hit this drive motor shaft. Um, it's very, it has a little clearance, um, but it does contact, unfortunately. So it requires that pattern spacer. And past that, you're pretty much good to go. Um, in that case, you're really only switching out these two components, um, just your, your bevel spur and your bevel pin and gear. Let's see. And Devboy um, asks the last question for the night. Um, are there any plans to sell the chassis with miter gears? Um, that's a question we we're discussing actually in R&D. We talked about it this morning, and I'm sure we're going to talk about it tomorrow and for a few days after that. Um, I'm a big proponent of it. I love this chassis, but you never know. Um, our research and development team is always collaborative, and your side might not always win um, in, a, in a collaborative environment like that. So I, I would really love to see it, but I can't say for sure right now. Thanks for watching. If you want more fun content, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos. Thanks to all of our co-executive producers on Patreon and Tier 2 Plus subscribers on Twitch, keeping fun loud, live, and independent.